Warframe, Outriders, Destiny, and Anthem. What do these games have in common? Well, they're all sci-fi looter shooters, and the First Descendant aims to join them with their own unique take on the genre. Hi, I'm the host of the Curse Kiss Cafe, Empress Tiramisu, and today's serving is a nice hot helping of just what we think of the First Descendant based upon the Steam beta. The First Descendant will be a free, third-person cooperative action RPG shooter with a focus on unique characters, exciting gunplay, and strategic, intense four-player boss fights. As a Descendant, you must defend Ingress, the last bastion of humanity, with your unique abilities, plethora of gun choices, and all the while uncovering the mysteries of the land. We'll be breaking down the flavors of this delicious game by taking notes on the story, environments, enemies, playable characters, weapons and gear, and systems. So sit back, grab a snack, and let's get into it. As we begin this section, obligatory spoiler warning, as we'll be covering the story given to us thus far. So if you care about seeing it for yourself with no influence, skip this part. Otherwise, I'll try my best to recap the narrative as accurately as I possibly can, so bear with me in case I miss some things. Right off the bat, I will alleviate some curiosity and say that the story isn't anything you haven't seen before, and you cutscene skippers can continue to skip to your heart's content. For those curious about the actual story, however, it puts us in the middle of the conflict between humans and the Volgus that started a hundred years ago on the Ingress continent. The Volgus are a race that has crossed the dimension to destroy and wipe out humans. Layer this with the sudden appearance of the Colossuses who bring destruction to everything and humans were on the brink of being wiped out. Those who could manage scramble to the last bastion of humanity called Albion uh, it was then that another faction of the Volgus called the Magisters would join them and lead them and lend them their aid with their highly advanced technological skills. The Magisters' reason for joining the remaining humans? Well, the same technology that they created was being used to destroy the new home of theirs and they would not stand for it any longer. Especially because the new leader of the Volgus, Carol, seeks to bring about absolute destruction by seeking out hearts of iron. So to help the humans fight back, the Magisters helped them ditch their swords and shields at the time for guns and gunpowder. Not only that, but thanks to the advancements in technology, the Magisters were able to discover that within humans lay the dormant arch gene, a gene with infinite potential that when awakened within some grants them powerful magical abilities that allowed a single descendant to become a one-man army against an army of Volgus, and even take on Colossus as a squad of four. Called descendants because it's believed that the powers they inherit were passed down from the ancestors who had only ever been referenced in ancient texts. All of this accumulates in humanity's last line of defense and hope for the future of Ingress. Now, I won't sit here and recount the entirety of the story for you, um, because I want to, I want people to save that experience for themselves if they care enough about it. You know, again, if not, no sweat off my bones, but I will go over some important points, though, in case it does somehow go over, you know, the heads of many. Uh, point A, you meet a mysterious ginger-haired woman who calls herself the Guider. She taps in when your team experiences technical difficulties. No one else outside of our descendants seems to be able to see her. Point B, there are multiple but seemingly finite hearts of iron uh, hunted down by both humans and the Volgus. These hearts are powerful relics that function as huge power sources. They uh, also supposedly predate the Volgus on Ingress, predate the arrival of the Volgus on Ingress. Point C, the sages themselves seem to be some kind of council of magisters who also act as sources of information and research. Point D, Carol is, is trying to actually summon back the original ruler of the Volgus by gathering as many hearts of iron as possible to break the barrier that also keeps Colossus from flooding into our world. And finally, point E, 
The Colossus and Volgus have been fighting each other for ages, as it turns out, and humans were actually just dragged into the middle of it. Now, hopefully, I didn't overload your noggins too much. This doesn't even factor, these story points don't even factor in the individual story arcs of each area as you progress through the zones that contribute to pushing the overall narrative. While I feel the story does have some solid, cohesive elements, oftentimes I'm left feeling like there are, there, there's a lack of bridging events between situations. Like, without giving away anything, it often feels cut and dry from one story plot to the next. That leads to certain bosses feeling like they've kind of come out of nowhere. And this is most notable in the Albany Mountains and the Tree of Life storyline. The game does try, however, to give you certain story bits of information as digestible as possible and then have you connect the dots on your own. They also, it also makes an attempt to have you care about the characters throughout the story. Like, initially, Alpha comes off as a brooding commander who's got this aged air about him, and is, he's certainly a battle-scarred hunk, and it could stop there. However, we find out this man wants to be on the front lines. He wants to be fighting. He wants to avenge the comrades that he's lost during the time in this war. But the sages, the descendants, they both need him in Albion overseeing operations and using his long history and experience to guide them. This is especially solidified during a quest in the Red Desert, the last area we had access to for the beta, but I won't spoil it for you, just know that like I personal, like, personally felt his pain in that. The final story quest for the Red Desert on this topic was actually a cliffhanger, which no shock to anybody, they're not going to give us the full story right away. Um, but they, it does leave a lot of questions that, that I hope we find answers for. Such as, who exactly is the guider? Why does she know so much? Is there any infighting among the Volgus? A splintering of factions? Who really were the ancestors? And what kind of secrets were they keeping? Why is this gene that's been inside of us this whole time suddenly coming forward? You know, what were the Hearts of Iron? What were they originally being used for? Could there possibly be other settlements hidden away from both the Volgus and, you know, the Descendants that have been surviving this whole time? I really, really hope we get questions to these answers in the full release, but chances are we'll get, the list of questions will actually get longer before it gets shorter. Um, now, people who really want to chew on some higher level story, some of that high level fantasy, they might not find this as interesting and deep as I'm making it, but I do find that, again, the game has some solid ground to build a strong story with the bits that we've been given so far. And with a bit of tweaking and translation cleanup, we could be in for a wild ride, a wild ride that doesn't veer too much into unhinged territory. Which, speaking of unhinged territory, I hope to see more development of Colossuses because as far as, for as dangerous as they are touted in the story, they are kind of relega relegated to being side content. Like, outside of the one we fight in the opening of the story, they don't pop up in the story ever again. You kind of get a quest where a Sage explains, you know, the theme and mechanics of each new one you unlock. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's just a me thing. Maybe, maybe it's just a me thing. But I would like to see them incorporate more into the story as actual threats. You know, maybe as like weaker boss fights on a timer in each zone or like the big bat at the end of a story quest chain. You know, some, something to help them feel as part of the story and not like an afterthought or, you know, as they're used for farming new descendants, which we'll touch on in another section. But, um... That's probably my biggest sticking point story-wise. Uh, as they stood during the beta, they were basically a quick grab for some weapons, runes, gears, descendant farm. Um, not they, they didn't really have any impact on the story outside of what's stated in lore and that first opening mission. However, all that said, the story does receive a 7.5 out of 10 from me. Moving on to the next topic, we have the environments of the world of Ingress. 
The First Descendants aims to make sure to let you know that they're running on a Unreal 5. Just being honest, there is something left to be desired when it comes to the visuals of each zone. As you, pro as you progress, perhaps the best spots were the ruin-based areas within the maps. Um, the outside areas, particularly in Kingston and the Albany Mountains, weren't really much to look at. It kind of just had your standard greenery that was formerly, and, and like buildings that were like formerly inhabited, littered about here and there. Um, it wasn't until the Red Desert that I felt immersed in the environment of the game, specifically towards the end of the area where there are like floating block platforms that you have to jump between. Uh, it added this like flair that I thought was missing from the earlier areas. Um, even then, um, for the most part, the Red Desert was sand for as far as the eye can see. And every so often you dip into a cave underneath the sand where there were, of course, more ruins and uh, a few other things that were a little bit better to look at. Um, so I do hope moving forward the areas are a little more dynamic and engaging. When you're like running through, they feel like they're, they're more than they feel a little more than a blur because you're so focused on your objective at hand and and you're not really thinking about interacting with your environment outside of grappling around or if you're playing as Bunny, one of the descendants, you're literally just zooming through and everything is pretty much a blur. Um, certainly in terms of interest, in terms of interesting areas, for me, the ranking is Red Desert, Kingston, and then the Albany Mountains. Uh, that's that's kind of just how it stacks up for me. Of course, take this with a grain of your favorite seasoning. I wasn't running my game on Ultra. I know some people were, but I couldn't notice the difference between Ultra and Medium. And, you know, may maybe on Ultra it's a little bit shinier, but I'm, I'm just going to stick to my guns and say that there really wasn't anything that stood out to me significantly on each map that made me go, wow, this engine is doing work. Um, we don't know anything about the ecology of Ingress, but it would have been nice to see, like, wildlife. Even if the wildlife was an environmental hazard to the descendants, like a random deer cluster or something that attacks anything that got close. Um, and, like, I guess outside of enemies and missions, the maps just felt, like, empty. Like, it was empty visuals, as it were, uh, would be the best way, I guess, to put it. Again, though, you're probably going through it fast enough you won't notice or care too much. But if you do, if you're somebody that pays attention to little details like that, um, I'm sure you'll find the maps a little bit interesting to look at. But otherwise, it's, it's really nothing special. It's nothing that really that... How do I put this? It, there was nothing that was really like Unreal Engine 5 about it. Um, so unfortunately, while it was kind of pretty, it didn't do anything for me. So I'm only going to give the environments a 3 out of 10. Now, we discuss the primary antagonist you'll be seeing as a descendant. This part is a, will be a little bit chunky and heavy because we're not just talking about the variety of enemies, but we're also going to talk a little bit about how they act, the difficulty, and their impact. Your first encounter of Volgus sets you up with their standard enemy types, typical soldier-style mobs that look to pelt you with lead and hope you don't respawn afterwards. They seem to be vaguely synthetic life forms up until you hit the Red Desert, where both visually and mechanically, there starts to be minor differences. Uh, it also helps that when you hit the Red Desert, you learn that there are multiple legions that make up the Volgus. Similar in vain to something like the Imperium of Man from Warhammer 40k. Uh, each represents different aspects and approaches to combat, with some enemy types stretching across legions. It's also familiar with game. It's also very similar to games like Diablo or Path of Exile. Sometimes special enemies will spawn with modifiers. For example, above its name, it'll say summons wells of fire or gives overshield to nearby allies. Just like in those games too, if you're not paying attention and let them move about and do their thing, you will be in for a world of trouble. You'll get smacked down before you even know what's happening in some cases. From what I gather, packs tend to spawn with fodder, infantry, heavies, snipers, melees, and elites. 
The order and composition varies, but that's kind of the gist. Fodder enemies tend to either be like um, self-destructing type. Infantries are usually standing somewhere in the mid-range shooting at you. Heavies will be normally larger, rounder, or more armored enemies with heavy guns like Gatling guns or LMGs. Snipers, of course, will be on high vantage points. Melees will be running at you, and elites uh, sometimes spawn somewhere in the pack or the wave. Uh, they are usually named, and they are usually the ones that carry the modifiers. Um, the legions we have currently been exposed to include the Legion of Darkness, the Legion of Immortality, and the Order of Truth. The Legion of Darkness seems to be the standard military-style legion. They're the ones you fight for the most part up until about the Albany Mount, somewhere in the Albany Mountains. And then it starts to slowly, then you slowly start to fight the Legion of Immortality, who employ more like technology in combat with like self-destructing drones, directional barriers. Um, this legion is also the one that seems to have more connection to the magisters themselves because I. I guess, the use of technology here. And in the Red Desert, you slowly start to transition and get a mix of uh, not only the Legion of Immortality, but also enemies from the Order of Truth who lean a little bit more towards the occult. Uh, they will start having units that are, like, spewing poison. Um, they also uh, self-destruct into poison blasts. They like the enclosed... They take advantage of, like, the enclosed spaces with enemies that leap on you constantly um and uh yeah so those are the three legions that we have currently been exposed to but uh to try and cover all the individual designs uh within the legions would take forever also i didn't really think about it at the time to try and document and record all the various all the variations so you know, luckily, we don't we don't want this part to take up more time than it already does. But you will notice that between as you progress through the game, there is a shift in enemy types. It might be it might be minute for the most part because again, you know, you're you're speeding through, you're trying to complete your mission, get through the story, unlock more things. So you probably won't notice the variation in enemy types right away if you're just blitzing through. Um you might not catch those minute differences between the different legions, which uh, could then make the enemies and combat feel very samey and not diverse, but I assure you there is some variety to the enemy pool. Now, beyond the Volgus, in terms of open map content, you won't see any other enemies. Uh, as mentioned in the environment section, there isn't even any wildlife or neutral factions to engage with. It's strictly engaging the Volgus at every turn. As soon as you zone in on the map, whether you're doing a whether you're activating a mission that will spawn in Volgus, Volgus will be there already, you know, wandering around doing whatever they're doing. Um, but if you're itching for if that's way too easy for you and you're itching for more ball busting combat, you'll find that with the Colossus and a mission type called Interception. These dimension tearing havoc wreaking giants cause trouble and destruction wherever they appear and are considered the true enemies of the Volgus. Uh, they're so strong, it actually takes a f squad of four descendants to take one down. Literally, you start the game fighting one, and it doesn't do an actual Colossus fight justice, in my opinion. Obviously, depending on the Colossus itself, the fight chaos scale varies, but generally, you can't just face tank all of their mechanics and think it'll be okay. Now, lore-wise, Colossus serve to be this big bad that even the Volgus are afraid of, and the two have been at war for ages. Also, something, something, the original Volgus leader is lost in Colossus space. Gameplay-wise, Colossuses are used to farm components that are used to then craft descendants. To do this, you need to complete a survival or defense mission in which you have a chance of obtaining amorphous material of varying types. You look at the Colossus tag to the material, kill it, open it, and at the end, hope you get the part that you need. Sound familiar?
Then you've played Warframe and are familiar with the relic system. It functions much the same way. You farm a relic with a specific item attached, take it to the appropriate mission, crack it, hope you get the loot you wanted. The biggest difference is that unlike Warframe, there's no way to skew the probability of the reward you want. In addition to farming for your descendant pieces, Colossus has also dropped rare runes and sometimes decent weapons of your level. So even if you don't have any amorphous material and say you're helping out a friend, you know, take down a Colossus, you still get a little bit of something out of the run. At any time, um, at the time of the Steam beta test, there were five normal interception bosses and three hard ones. I won't go into each one specifically to preserve people experiencing the battles and mechanics for themselves, but all Colossus fights take place in a separate space called the Void, an all-black environment that's also destructible. So yes, a Colossus will literally destroy your cover if it walks into it, uh, melees it, it will crumble, and you will have to seek shelter somewhere else. I've never seen a team run out of cover, but I wouldn't doubt it happen. You have 10 minutes to eliminate the Colossus before the fight fails, and you can only challenge a Colossus as a party of four and have two options, either use matchmaking or bring a pre-made. Now, if I had to leave some notes about the, um, the enemy, well, actually, before we get into my final notes about the enemies, um, also understand that during a Colossus fight, you have four revives that are shared between the party. So... You know, try not to soak up all the revives for your team. And um, there was one other thing, but it escapes me at this point. But if I do have to leave some notes about the enemies in the game cur as they currently stand, I would A, love to see some more mob density. The maps only hold four players at a time. And it often feels like mobs are a blip. You don't get to really, like play with your guns and your powers in the way that I feel like you should be able to when you're out there doing the missions. Because the enemies are, you get maybe three or four enemies at a time. And and it's, it doesn't make sense to me that like, they're trying to reclaim and conquer humans. It just feels a little weird that they're not sending out full platoons after us. Like, you know, actual waves of enemies, which you don't really experience unless you play like a defense. Um, B, there's this, like, this one's a little strange, but sometimes, when I was playing, sometimes it felt like the mobs were a little smaller than I feel like they should have been. Um, so I would like to see them have a, a bit more of a physical size increase to some of them. Uh, C, I would like to see t damage toned down just a smidge. Not too much, but just enough that, like, you know, you don't get one shot by a sniper if you didn't notice them right away. Uh, and and I mostly say this because no matter how much it felt like I pumped up my survivability, and again, I'm not the best I'm not the best gamer out there. But no matter how much I pumped up my descendant survivability, or if I had a defensive ability active, it sometimes just felt like a mob would just like clap you at a moment's notice. And meanwhile. They're sitting there eating all your bullets. So I would like to see them tone down the damage just just a little bit. Just a little bit. And finally, I would like easier readability for special mobs. It's a little difficult to pick out like special mobs in a horde. And, and it ties in with my uh, C point a little bit. Where you get popped before you know what's happening. So some way of noticing when they zone in would be great. Given that like it's not like Diablo. It's not like path of exile where we have that top-down perspective and we can immediately see you know the glowing outline of a special mob and it has you know the health bar pops up with the modifiers so i would like some easier way to spot out special mobs in fights or, or when they zone in um and like while i feel the enemy types are pretty robust i still think that they could use a bit of bolstering they have given us a nice base of variety, but surely they can take it a step further and like really play up the identities of the, of the Vulgus legions. I believe this would go a long, long way in making the fights not feel too samey as you're playing through the game and give the players something to chew on. Like that, that's, that's 
that's the hefty note I have here. I want them to push the identities of the legions a little bit more so that we have some, you know, so that combat is a little bit more dynamic. Thus, I'm going to give the enemies of the descendants a 6 out of 10. Probably the most important topic, if nothing else in this entire essay, as a player, you control someone called a Descendant. If you've ever played Warframe, you know this song and dance. When you first start the game, you have access to Vietha, Ajax, and Lepic. The tutorial forces you to pick one, but you can actually swap between all three for free afterwards. I'm only going to briefly touch upon their themes and abilities, otherwise Again, this section will be longer and chunkier than it probably needs to and that I have the mental fortitude to withstand. <laughs> so diving in, we have Ajax who takes on the tank role, being able to absorb a hefty amount of damage that also fuel his abilities, but also being able to deploy various types of shields. I say various, but it's between a wall and a dome. Le Pic takes on the role of AoE damage dealer, rocking a built-in grenade launcher, a way to boost his own damage, and a way of grouping enemies so that you can land your AoE abilities easier. Finally, of the starting trio, trio we have Viesa, who takes on a utility mage role. With her ability to manipulate ice, she can slow and immobilize groups of enemies, making them easier targets. During the Steam beta, we were also given Bunny for free. Bunny is a speedster who zooms around the battlefield with her ability to manipulate electricity. When built up, she can then unleash it into she can then unleash it to devastate groups of enemies and be on to the next group before anyone even notices what happened. Following up with Bunny, I acquired Freyna, and Freyna takes on this role of dot damage dealer, spreading poison across the battlefield and relishing in prolonged fights. She even has the ability to tank up a bit of damage while inflicting said poison on enemies. Moving along, we've got Sharon who takes on the role of Assassin. She can camouflage to approach enemies unseen and even deal bonus damage should, they be focused, should their attention be focused on something that's not her. Jaber is next on our list, and this man assumes the role of Support Engineer with his ability to summon two kinds of turrets, one to attack and one to heal. Juggling his turret upkeep and enhanced version of those turrets are key to optimizing his gameplay. Glay is one of the popular favorites who functions in this berserker style role. High risk and high reward are the cornerstones of her gameplay as she can go berserk for increased damage and mayhem at the cost of natural healing or stay in normal mode to become kind of tanky, provide stuns in her ultimate, self-heal, or cut the damage inflicted by enemies. Blair is our next batter up, and similar to Freyna, he fills in a dot damage dealer role. His style differs from Freyna in the fact that one, he uses fire, and two, he is more burst damage oriented. While there are basic descendants, there are also ultimate versions. The only playable one at the time was Ultimate Lepic. Uh, and teased on one of the loading screens was Ultimate Ajax. It can be assumed that Ultimates are basically the equivalent of Prime Frames from, from Warframe, so they've most likely got increased baseline stats, a new look, and that's probably about it. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to acquire Ultimate Lepic in my playtime, so I can't give you a 100% accurate uh, description of what it would be like. But uh, to craft a new Descendant, you need four parts. You need reinforced cells, uh, a relic, a catalyst, and a kit. These can all be gotten from farming amorphous materials from survivals and defenses, then tackling whatever Colossus is attached to that particular material, and hope you get the drop you need. Once you have it, you can take it over to Magister Xenia and research it. Uh, the individual pieces take about four hours to craft, and once you have those in your possession, you can craft the associated descendant, and that takes eight hours to bake. Now, we, we know the playable character. Now that we know who the playable characters are, 
I can kind of address the issues and things that I have with them appropriately. So if you look at some of the kits and you've played like Warframe or Destiny, you'll see with You'll see that in early gameplay, you can it'll help you familiarize yourself with the world as you progress through the game. I'm not going to sit here and tell you which is the best Descendant to start with, because again, you can swap between all three as you so choose, as the mission types, you know, bosses come up, you can, as long as you go back to Albion, the safe zone, you can swap between Descendants before your next mission. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's up to preference which of the three you want to start with and focus on. Um, now, it's once you get access to farming and crafting as a descendant, you want to figure out who to spend time farming. Still, I'm not going to make recommendations. That's not my area. I'm going to leave that to, you know, people with more, with more knowledge on that aspect of things. And, again, up to personal taste who you wish to go after and farm. Um, being honest, though, I think the kits for the Descendants are okay. They work, and you can see the direction I think the devs wanted to take the particular Descendant in. However, I don't think uh, they're as impactful as they could be. Take Viesa, for example. She's supposed to feel like an ice mage. Who doesn't mind, who doesn't mind being in the fray? When using her abilities, they feel like they, they felt more like soft gusts of wind as opposed to I can manipulate frost and 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 really slow down my enemies. Like I was expecting some heavy, you know, not exactly Elsa style gameplay, but I was expecting to feel like a like a battle ice mage. Um like her her ice blast more often than not, no matter how accurately I tried to aim it. Felt like it just went in whatever direction it wanted to and and just missed. And her ultimate, the Ice Storm, felt small and like weak. Most of the times when I would throw it out, I was like, did I did it did it go anywhere? Did it go off? Did it land? I couldn't I, I didn't know where it was. I didn't know if it was doing anything. <laughs> um I enjoyed Freyna probably the most of the descendants. And Unfortunately, she still suffered from that same thing as Viesa, where there was like an an absence of impact on her abilities. Compound this with the fact that I feel like her first ability and her third ability were basically identical, minus two or three extra effects on the three, and her kit felt kind of empty sometimes. Like, I get the idea is to spread as much poison as possible, then open up on enemies with your ultimate for as much damage as possible. But I felt like there was a missed opportunity to give her the ability to apply poison buffs on her weapons, or maybe even some kind of apparatus that could spread poison in a small area, some kind of, like, drone that she can, you know, summon up and it will just sprinkle her poison around it. Um, otherwise, you know, that, that stuff aside, I still think her kit was nice for long fights. Um, not that there were many long fights in terms of open world missions, but definitely during uh, interceptions, I felt like that's where she was shining the most. Uh, I don't play Ajax. I didn't play Ajax myself, but from what I gather from those that did dabble around with him, he felt super. He felt like a super strong asset to a team, with his berries and shields being able to provide cover where there was none and give repeat give some reprieve in heavy gunfights, or even interceptions. Uh, it also doesn't have to be stated how strong a descendant, a defensive descendant such as him is, you know, in the case of also defense missions and being able to protect objectives from, you know, unseen enemy fire. Um, in a similar vein to that, there was Jaber, who is the only one capable of providing team-wide healing with his restoration turret, um, you know, he could be slotted into most compositions quite well. I've, I had seen him be able to tank mechanics from certain Colossuses, as long as he stayed within the confines of his enhanced, uh, heal restoration turret. And in some cases, even being able to survive 100% radiation during survivals until you got a neutralizer drop. 
Um, also, being able to draw aggro to one of his turrets really helps filter enemies if you don't have a lepic with the like traction grenade thing he has. Um, earlier, I also mentioned Glay being one of the crowd's favorites, and that's for good reason. To the point they had to release a patch to slightly tone her down, Glaze Berserk mode allow her, allowed her to deal buku amounts of damage to enemies in one go. I'm talking to the point where she could take, like, she was taking out probably the hard, all of the hard mode Colossuses almost solo. If she got tanky enough to tank in her infinite ammunition pool while in her Berserk, berserk mode, it was a wrap. Personally, I think the only thing I want them to do with Glay is really lean into her Berserker mode a bit more um, in terms of physical design. Currently, when she's in that mode, her hair just goes wild like it's in a permanent wind tunnel. Um, so beyond that, I want them to push the design a little bit more. Like they don't need to give her horns or, you know, make it like super demonic or anything, but maybe a darker skin tone, uh, such as like a gray skin tone, if you guys are familiar with maybe like uh, when Sasuke was first going through his curse mark phase, how he had that like slightly like grayed skin, that tattooed scar thing on the bridge of his nose. You know, really, I really want them to lean into that into a darker design when she activates her berserk mode, so that like not only can teammates see okay my glaze in damage mode, but also so that glaze themselves, you know have some have a strong striking visual to look at while they play her um so i i really want them to lean into that you know play up on the vampire mythos of her berserker style because her ultimate's name knows for too so that's kind of like a, a big old giveaway that they wanted to do something like vampire-esque with her uh bunny it's kind of a funny character because of how her kit works you want to stay on the move charge up her passive and then you're just like zooming around the battlefield, zapping whatever you come in contact with. Uh, this does pose a slight problem in one game mode, and that is survival. <laughs> uh, many times, due to the fact that the, uh, the resource that drops that reduces radiation is shared among the party, when you have a bunny haphazardly running around, she's going to soak up all of the, uh, the neutralizers, and thus no one else will get any and then they'll wind up hitting a hundred percent and and taking damage meanwhile she's sitting at like five percent so uh if you're gonna play if you're going to play bunny going into the game releasing please be very mindful during survivals to not just zoom around and pick up all the loot because the neutralizers are shared in the party everybody's got a sharing is caring um the only aspect of her kit that I personally am not too big of a too sold on is the ultimate, which fires a, once you have charged up your passive enough, you can fire off this beam that slows you down, drains your charge, and then it you know it's supposed to do this like sustained damage thing. I think the beam is cool, but I also think it could be better. Um, you know, they could have done a big bada boom lightning storm or something, or uh, amplify, you know, a uh, amplified version of one of her passes where she jumps into the air. If she does a double jump and lands, you know, it does a big lightning explosion as opposed to the small one. Um, you know, some something, they really could have played it up a big more. I remember seeing on social media that a lot of people compared Bunny to a Volt with a working passive, and I thought that was hilarious. Um, so, finally, of my personal assessments, though, of the Descendants that I've uh, managed to be in contact with or play, uh, Sharon. I wanted to like Sharon so badly, and I still do. I still I still really like what she brings to the table. Her playstyle is supposed to reward being elusive, and, you know, it, it works way better when you're teamed up with someone who can draw aggro attention, like a Jaber with his turrets or an Ajax. Um... And, and she could do some real good damage in, in that case. However, comma, her kit is hindered by exceptionally long cooldowns. And I do mean long. Her camouflage has a reset mechanic on it that upon killing an enemy, when you exit, when you exit camouflage, if you kill an enemy within X amount of time, 
it resets the cooldown. However, the reset is on a 45 second cooldown, which means you can you use camouflage, go in, do damage, get the reset, camouflage out. Which in theory should work, but when you've got an army at your feet and you can only hit so many enemies at a time, uh it, it's gonna pro it's gonna it's going to cause a problem. And I feel like her playstyle should reward getting chain resets. That 45 second cooldown on the reset itself hinders that. Especially if you're a solo player, you're most likely going to get decimated if you can't get your reset off. Um, I I just I see no point in having such a horrendously long cooldown on an integral part of her kit, in my opinion. Um, which then brings me to her ultimate. God bless the ultimate. When you activate it, you better get up and go get a snack. Because the activation period, the wind-up time, is so long. By the time that you're able to fire it off, either the enemies themselves are dead if you're partied with somebody, or you're dead because you died mid-wind-up animation. Um, and it doesn't help that, like, it cancels camouflage. So even if you thought you had the idea of Sneak up behind the enemies and camouflage. Activate ult. No. You'll activate the ult, your camouflage will wear off, because you're still in the wind-up animation, the enemies will all turn around towards you because the clapping of your fucking ash cheeks alerted them, and you will get fired upon. However, when the ult does go off, it's quite satisfying, I will add. Um, the whole sending electro daggers at people, I kind of like it. I was expecting more of like a jet from Valorant ordeal, but you, you know, you, that's not what we got. So I would like to see her ultimate wind up time cut shorter, uh, as well as the reset cooldown time either cut short or removed entirely. There's no PvP in the game, so I really don't see a point in having my reset on a core mechanic of my kit be on such an extraneously long cooldown. Um, the last two descendants of Lepic and Blair, I have no comments on, as I did not witness many people play either of them, and I personally didn't have enough time to play them. Um, I think the only complaint I heard was Blair's ultimate having probably the chunkiest cooldown in the game, about 120 seconds, probably longer. Um, but in general, I think the kits work, as I said, and they fit into the world as they stand, but they could use a bit of refining to really make them feel like they really have weight during gameplay. I think the big thing missing from the kits is the weight of the abilities and feeling like they actually have impact and presence during a fight alongside the gunplay, even though the gunplay is the primary method of taking down enemies. Um, I don't want to speak on the physical designs of the Descendants too much, but the women, the, 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 the women could use some work. Like, let's not mince words like we mince garlic. Vieta's design makes me yawn. Doesn't give me much hope for her ultimate form. I'm not saying they need to elsify her, but she just, she lacks flavor to her design. Uh, Sharon is as melanated as we get with the playable characters. Also, almost couldn't tell Lepic and Blair apart at one point. Um, Ajax, Freyna, and Jaber are probably top three in terms of design for me because you can look at them, you can see them, you can recognize them, and you have- and they have interest in them. Ajax is all armored up. What is he hiding? What is he protecting? Freyna has these poison vials on her that gives, like, very viper, very, like, yes, I'm ready to- to- to spread toxicity. And then Jaber is, like, mysterious loner- you know, you want to approach him to talk to him, but his aura kind of says no. His attitude says yes, please talk to me. <laughs> now, I know it's different strokes for different folks, and I, I'm just personally not tasting the seasoning on the designs right now. Um, I'm hoping we get more descendants with varying body types and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we do see some of them as NPCs already. Again, our guider is a ginger-haired uh, woman. The first NPC we encounter in Kingston is a black man. Uh, and, 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 and my hope for this is really strong. Like, really, really strong. Because 
as it currently stands, people feel like the characters were AI art generated, and I can't say they're wrong. I, I, I honestly can't say they're wrong. Um, kit-wise, though, uh, in t for future Descendants, I don't have too many big expectations. Uh, I think they have the right idea with their current kit designs being unique enough that no character feels like a better or worse version of another. Uh, like, for example, in the case of Freyna and Blair. In, uh, they both fill a dot damage dealer role, but one is burst, one is sustain. You know, they prioritize different stats. One's a little bit tankier. One is a little bit more resource intensive. Um, potentially, we will have a hundred different descendants to pick from once the ball gets rolling. So there is a lot of room for variety in design and kit play, and I think that they are on the right track with that. Um, and before I close out this section, I do hope they scale back the frequency of voice lines. Um, I don't know how many times people are going to be able to hear VSS ask, why now? When she has to reload a gun that's run out of ammo. That's why now, Viessa. Uh, as well as probably the option to either turn off or um, entirely mute ally reload, sound, ally reload sounds and voice lines. Because there's no reason I need to know that you're reloading. I don't need to hear Viessa screaming out why now from across the distance. Um... But overall, I I think we're I think they're in the right direction. They're in the right arena, and with just a little bit more of a push, a little bit more of a uh, a little bit heavy-handed uh, seasoning, we could have some very interesting characters popping out in the first Descendants. So I'm willing to give them a seven out of ten. So we've touched on the world. The enemies, the playable characters of Ingress, but what of the meat and potatoes? If you have played Destiny in any capacity, then you'll be quite familiar with how to acquire weapons in the First Descendant. Simply complete missions for a weapon reward, killing mobs, and doing interceptions. There are three ammo types, Normal, Heavy, and I believe Special or red, blue, and green, to keep it simple. In terms of weapon diversity, we've got handguns, hand cannons, assault rifles, submachine guns, sniper rifles, launchers, scout rifles, tactical rifles, light machine guns, beam rifles, and even shotguns. You can equip up to three weapons and know that weapons uh, that share the same ammo type share your ammo pool, so beware. If you want a strong version of a weapon that you got, you need to farm the appropriate level for it as weapon drops don't scale with you. What this means is that if you found a weapon in Kingston at level 5 and go back there when you're level 40, the weapon drops there will still be level 5. You need to go to a higher level zone for higher level drops. This also applies to killing Colossuses. Low level Colossuses will drop low level gear. Uh, to further push your weapon's performance, you can equip runes, which function the same way as mods in Warframe do, with some differences. But more on the rune system in the next part. Finally, in terms of gear, we've got four slots dedicated to one gyro, one sensor, one coil, and one memory. Uh, these either affect our descendants' max HP, their defense, or max shield. Not gonna hold you though, the stats on them felt really low. To the point that you could probably run without them and not notice. Uh, this doesn't change too much when like, you get higher level and higher tier drops, the numbers still feel really low. Like they need to be boosted and quite frankly I didn't find myself running anything but the ones with max HP on them. Um, seeing as like shields didn't hold up very well and even like defense just never felt like enough. Uh, like, for example, a tier 2, or purple, level 18 coil only gives 25 defense versus, like, a tier 1 or, or blue level 21 coil that gives 23 max HP. Uh, these, these aren't percentages. These are flat numbers, and they just felt low. Uh, kind of like, kind of like you put on the gear piece just to have them on, and that's, like, that's maybe it. Maybe they were doing something, but I, I didn't, I didn't feel it. Uh, 
Weapons and gear do come in tiers, as I just previously mentioned. Tier 1 being blue, tier 2 being purple, and tier 3 being gold. Um, I think I only got one tier 3 gear at the end of my playtime. Of course, I wasn't really farming, and because it dropped from, I believe, a low-level Colossus, it was later outstatted by a random open-world mission or uh, gear drop, I believe. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they also don't come with like any extra special perks. It is literally just that one stat line. Um, final statement on weapons. Again, if you have Destiny knowledge, you'll know that no two weapons uh, drop with the same stat or perk rolls. Uh, if you're not familiar with this mean, if you're not familiar with this, what that means is that, say a handgun, we'll call it the Wolfsbane, drops twice for you. One could have fire, plus fire damage, and the other could have minus one second reload speed, plus ice damage. Um, it might have a higher uh, uh, reload, uh, not reload speed, but a higher uh, a max damage. So this might pose a bit of a problem later on when you find a weapon or weapon type you want to stick to, but find it's falling off. Um, and you want to upgrade, but there's no, like, there's no chance that should that weapon drop again, you'll get the stat or perks that you want that would make upgrading from the low level one to this more appropriate or stronger level one worth it. Um, and there's no way to alter or reroll weapon perks at the time of this beta. Um, so you'll wind up having to use whatever you get and hope that it has rolls that are passable enough for you. Um, I find that using the Destiny style weapon system adds a lot of replay value to missions, but also some frustration with trying to uh, find weapons with perks you might want to run in combination with your chosen descendant slash rune setup. Uh, outside of the weapon system, the gear system could use some work. Uh, like I said, it feels lackluster, low impact in terms of like stats, and it doesn't feel like it rewards you for slotting in all max HP or all defense or all max shielding uh, or, or any combination of, of those. Maybe early on it's supposed to be noticeable, but it just it gets lost in the shuffle of the game and other things that happen later on. So I'm gonna I'm personally giving this an eight out of ten because the weapon system carries for me, but the minus two is because the gear system is empty calories that don't taste good. Welcome to the final evaluation. In this section, we'll be tackling the miscellaneous stuff that I really couldn't figure out where to slot elsewhere. And we're going to start with the rune system. Uh, this is how you make your weapons and descendants stronger outside of leveling them up. They function quite similar to mods in Warframe with some unique twists. One of these twists being that runes are not equipped to the weapons themselves, but like to your character. So... Basically, when you take off a weapon to put on a new one, you don't need to remod it. Uh, weapons are broken down into Storm, Torrent, Tide, Thunder, and Haze. You can determine what rune type affects what weapon by looking at the line connecting the rune to the weapon. So Storm runes affect SMGs, assault rifles, and handguns. Torrent runes affect light machine guns, tactical rifles, and beam rifles. Tide runes affect scout rifles and hand cannons. Thunder runes affect sniper rifles and launchers. And haze runes affect shotguns. You start out with about five slots for runes on each weapon type and gain more as you level up your character slash mastery. Uh, again, bringing it back around to that Warframe comparison, you'll notice that each rune takes up capacity on a weapon. Uh, you can only slot in runes up to that number. This capacity, again, can be leveled up. You can also add symbols to slots that reduce the capacity of a rune with a matching symbol. Uh, so, to get the most out of the runes, make sure to pick the weapons you want to focus on and level up the runes that correspond to them. Now, runes for descendants themselves are a little less complex. Each descendant must equip their own runes. So if you swap to a new descendant, you've got to re-rune them up. 
You also will notice that if you have a rune equipped on another descendant, it will list them under it. This is a handy way of knowing what runes you are running on other characters, but it doesn't cause any conflicts as far as I'm aware. Just like with weapon runes, there are slots, rune capacity, socket types to manage. Uh, there is a special slot at the bottom of the Descendant Rune menu for a special rune called a Melee Rune. This does two things. It changes your melee attack based upon the slotted rune, and functions as a way to further increase rune capacity for your Descendant. Which, on the topic of melee runes, there is a, there is a melee button, However, there is like no melee combo that you are used to, like for Warframe, for example. It's more of on the Destiny side where it's a, a single hit, and then there is a cooldown about, I, I believe it's like five seconds or so, between you being able to melee again. I personally don't feel like there should be a cooldown between melees, but that's how they have it set up. That's how it is. Um, all runes, however, can be dismantled, enhanced, or fused through the rune vendor NPC. And he is found in Albion. Uh, you'll need the resource that comes from dismantling runes, extra runes and spare runes, to level up your other runes. And it does get quite pricey at a certain point, so you'll need all the, like, dust you can get. Uh, now, runes themselves also drop from all manner of content, killing open-world mobs, completing missions, doing interceptions, and even fusing multiple runes that you might not need to hopefully get one you don't already have. So, that's the rune system. Then we have the mastery level, which functions as kind of like an account level or mastery rank from Warframe. Uh, when you level this up, weapon and descendant rune slots or capacity goes up and you get more inventory slots to hold all your amassed junk. Uh, you get experience for it by leveling up weapon proficiencies, which I forgot to mention during the weapon section, uh, comes from simply using the weapon. As far as I'm aware, it's just a progress bar that adds to your mastery rank. It doesn't do anything to the weapon as far as I'm aware until otherwise confirmed. Um, in addition to that, uh, completing missions and leveling up descendants also contributes to your mastery rank. Uh, a, a mastery level, I apologize. Again, this is uh, separate from the descendant's own level. Uh, but when you hit a mastery rank, you saunter back to Albion, visit a machine, and poof, after a cutscene, you are the next mastery rank. No tests, no nothing needed. Um, go back out there, grind all over again. That same machine, though, um, not only does it help you get to your, rank up your mastery level, it also has the option to reset a descendant's level. So think of using Forma. You get your descendant to the max level of 40, reset them, they go back to level 1, but you keep your maxed out skills, and then you acquire something called an Arc Crystal. And that lets you alter uh, a rune socket's symbol. Um, there are also there are also some like crafted items with limited use that you can use to further increase your weapon or descendant rune capacity. I believe it's five times for each weapon ca uh, each weapon rune type and three times for descendants. Uh, the final in-game system I want to talk about is the quest progression. Now, while you're following the main story quest, you'll also have like breadcrumb quest in each zone that coincide with it. Um, think the patrol quest from Destiny, but instead of being optional content, they are used to lead you through the zone, and you can slash will come back to them to repeat them for rewards, experience, etc. Uh, I think it's a solid system that helps give players direction so they're not just floundering around all of the time. Uh, the only annoyance I can say I have is that you are called back to Albion at certain points during the quest questing series at like and and, it, and oftentimes it happens at a point where it feels like it kind of kills the momentum a little bit, um, and and you're told information that probably could have been an email. <laughs> Instead, they have you, you know, they summon you back and you got to run from person A to person B and then it's back to where you left off in the field. And luckily, usually when this happens. There is a fast travel camp nearby, so it's not like you have to travel back to the start of the map and make your way back to where you left off. 
So it's not that big of a deal. Um, and uh, my only other gripe, which I mentioned during the enemy section already, but oftentimes missions will throw enemies at you in like a drip fashion. So it kind of feels like uh, they're not much of a threat. You can you can AFK most of the missions and complete them and not really think too much. Uh, you you know they're, they're kind of just thrown at you to complete the mission objective and then poof it's off to the next one. Um, oh, actually, one other thing I want to talk about is movement in the game. Movement is a huge element of the game. In this game, uh, we have a grappling hook to access high places that double jump can't get to, and that's if you remember you have a double jump. Uh, the, the grappling hook is a little janky sometimes, but there is a setting to help it kind of like correct its aiming reticule, reticule um, and that seemed to help me. Uh, once you get over, like, the initial hump of understanding these systems, it's, it's a, it's a pretty clean 8 out of 10 for me. Uh, runes aren't too different from mods in Warframe, give you the ability to fine-tune and control your builds as well as you, as much as you can outside of, like, RNG factoring of drops. Uh, quests do leave a bit to be desired, but they don't subtract from the experience. So. If you've managed to sit through all of that and uh, make it here, I really appreciate you for that, and you're a real one. Uh, hopefully, though, this essay from this essay, you can take away that the First Descendant has a solid foundation to launch a strong game for themselves. With some narrative cleanup, uh, slight gameplay adjustments, and maintaining open communication with the community, I think think we'll have another solid looter shooter on the market in the vein of Warframe. Something with similar ingredients, but an altered flavor profile. Um, you know, the, the kind of endless progression that a lot of people like. And um, actually, uh, on, that, on that note, I actually forgot to mention optimization at some point. Um, I remember a lot of people with decently high-end rigs Still having frame issues, among other things, during the Steam beta. Uh, I guess it goes without saying, I hope that they also work on resolving those um, for a, a, a smoother player experience once the game goes live. It's also one of those things that, that I feel is like integral to a successful game. The more players with access to a game, the higher the chances of building and retaining a loyal player base. Um, no game will ever be 100% perfect, but it can be a ton of fun when executed right. What is right, I can't answer that. I can only convey what I would like to see and hope that at some point they address those things. If they don't, you know, I, it's not going to make me any less interested in the game. I would just simply take a more cautious approach to investing too deeply, whether it be emotionally or financially, into the game itself because you don't, you're not sure on, you know, how the devs plan on executing certain things or if they're listening or, you know, whatever uh, the case might be. But overall, I can't wait to see how the first Descendant lands once it's officially out and available to the public at large. I really hope that they take all the feedback they attained during the Steam beta and and put it to good use. Like, you don't have to listen to everything, but there are certain things that I, I feel like they should listen to and hopefully uh, implement. Because if you could catch the drift of, of this essay so far, a lot of things that they have in the game felt close, but not there. Like, it, it, a constant state of edging without release. Uh, that's kind of just the, the, the current uh, vibe, as it were, that the game puts out. Like, yeah, it's good. It's, it's almost there, but it's, it just misses that one thing that really you know, bumps it up. And, and mind you, my scores, I, I guess, are pretty generous. Um, but, you know, they, they, the minute things that are missing would really go a long way in bumping up, I feel, the, the scores and the expectations of those aspects within the game. But um, if you haven't yet, and anything I said here 
even interests you slightly about the game, please go on over to Steam and wishlist it. Uh, and follow them on Twitter, if that's still a thing at the time of this video coming out. Uh, take care, and I will see you guys next time. Mwah.